I don't know if this has ever uh, happened to you or not, or if you've ever been in a, in a situation or a place where you're maybe surrounded by people, maybe it's at work or at a party, and, and everyone sort of knows someone but you. So they're all like telling stories, or like laughing about, did you see what you know, Chuck did, and, and all these things, and, they're, and everybody's getting a kick out of it, and you have like no context for what's going on. Like you don't know Chuck, you don't know why he's so funny, you don't know why everybody loves him so much. And, and that's kind of what it feels like to read Hebrews chapter seven. <laughs> like we, we, this morning, we're gonna look at this passage where there's this guy we're introduced to named Melchizedek, who isn't really discussed or brought up hardly at all anywhere. Actually, this is the only example in the New Testament. He only comes up in Hebrews. And he's only other brought up two other times in the entire Old Testament. So we know uh, very, very little about him. Um, and yet the author in our series now in Hebrews seems to make a huge deal out of him. He, he, he wants to focus in on him, like I said, more than really any other place and in the whole Old Testament, it seems like it comes out of nowhere. And so the question becomes, why is he introducing us to him? And, and how does this ultimately help us understand more about who Jesus is and what he's done? So we're going to take a look today at this, this man, this king named Melchizedek, and see what we can determine or why, what, how we can make sense of who he is and why he's here. And just kind of by way of refresher, we have, we've been in this series on the book of Hebrews, and, and this is a letter that is written to a group of Christians in, who grew up in the Jewish faith, Jewish background, and they, they've come to believe that Jesus is their Messiah, and now as a result of that, they're experiencing in their life intense persecution. Matter of fact, persecution to the degree that some of them are beginning to wonder, or perhaps even have already made a decision to abandon their faith. They're, they're looking to, to escape this pain and suffering. So this letter that's, that's being sent to them is this impassioned and urgent plea that is written into the context of that suffering. He's trying to make his case for why it would be a tragic mistake for them to walk away from their, their, their faith. And his primary point is, is essentially this, and hence the title of, of our entire series, is that ultimately Jesus is greater than. Like throughout the whole book, he's been going back and he's been taking all of their sort of values and, and their way of thinking and their way of doing things, and he, he simply is trying to demonstrate time and time again how Jesus is the fulfillment of what they longed for previously. So he's saying, don't, don't go back to what you previously knew because ultimately what that was leading you to is the person and work of Jesus. This is why we call this series, Jesus is Greater Than. I would argue too, by the way, that, that the, case, the same case could be made for things that we have a tendency to run to in our own life and experience when perhaps we're searching or we're questioning or we're doubting or we're struggling or we're suffering or we're experiencing pain, all these sorts of things. We have those tendencies. We talked before about spiritual drift. Like I think the same, the Hebrews point is the same for us as it was for them. And what I found interesting about how this book unfolds, and maybe you've noticed this, is that, that the author sort of makes this primary or fundamental point and then he'll kind of emphasize his point by returning to it. It almost gets a little repetitious at times, returning to it and adding like another layer to that which he's already established. It's like, I don't know, like I grew up learning math. Like I had a, 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 a graph that my teacher gave me. It was like six and five and you just memorize that number, right? That, that's how you learned multiplication. Like my daughters, I've noticed in, uh, they've learned math they learn a skill, they learn how these things happen, then they add the skill that's next to it on, and as they do that, they come back to the previous skill to do that more. It's, like, it's more cyclical than it was for me where, where I had to learn math, it was all linear. It was we learn this skill, then you move on to this skill, then you move on to this. It's a it's different way of learning, and apparently it's an ancient way of learning because the author of Hebrews is doing this. He keeps coming back to this similar point and he's saying, let me add a little bit of evidence to this. Let me show you one more thing. 
So all together, this book has been making this point about how Jesus is our great high priest. And now he's going to add just another layer. Another piece of evidence as, as why we should view Jesus this way. And he's going to do so by saying that Jesus has become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, whoever that is. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to look at this together to answer the question, who is Melchizedek? But then also, how does understanding Melchizedek help us understand Jesus? So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 6. This is actually, I'm going to kind of pick up where we left off last week, the very end of what Pastor Jeff was preaching on a week ago, and then we're going to kind of make our way into the beginning of chapter 7, and we're going to kind of focus there most of the morning. So let's look at this together. This is chapter 6, verse 19. It says, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the place, inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to Abraham, and Abraham apportioned a tenth, and to him Abraham apportioned a tenth of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning nor ends of days, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. So let's begin by looking at, at what the author wants us to understand, not only about how Jesus is our great high priest, but how he is a greater type of high priest, a greater type of high priest. I don't know if you've ever uh, watched your kids or teaching them something, or maybe this has been your experience where somebody's watching you do something and they come alongside of you and say, there's a better way, there's a better way to do that. Um, many of you know, for, for years, I led mission trips down to, to Ecuador. Um, and one of the projects that we would do, and some of you were on these trips, is that we would go up into the side of the mountain and, and you would uh, take down these huge eucalyptus trees because they had to pretty much make everything that they did there. So if they were building a building on their side, if they were adding like dormitory space, you, they, they did that all kind of on their own. So we would go take down these timbers that they were going to use to help build the buildings. And they would fall them on the side of the mountain and then they had to get from where they were taken down, down to kind of a level path where we could tie it to a tractor and take it down a few thousand feet to, to the base camp where we operated out of. So we would do this uh, time, to, and it was, it was hard work. These, these, these timbers weighed hundreds, if not a thousand pounds or more. They're on the side of a mountain. You can't really get good footing, but when you would get it down there in order to dry out the timber, we would have teams of students who would take hammers and you would smack the bark all the way down the length of the timber. And once you kind of cracked the bark, you could, it would peel off almost like a banana peel. Like you could get the, the whole thing off. And so this was the process. Fall the timber, get it down the side of the mountain, take off the bark and, and get it out of there. The thing was, once you took that bark off, that tree became incredibly slippery. Like there was no gripping it at that point. All the moisture in the timber, that sort of thing, it was it was incredibly slick. So we were doing, spending hours, you know, days after day up there, take, bringing these timbers down to be dried out and used. And one of the students says, well, and one of the hardest parts of doing this was getting the timber down the side of the hill. I mean, it, it was just, you know, you'd go an inch at a time. Somebody would lay back, use their legs, push. It was like kind of a heave-ho thing. It could take uh, upwards of an hour just to get one timber down the side of the hill. And one of our students said, well, why don't we, why don't we peel the bark up here? It's, it's super slippery, and, and maybe once the bark is off, maybe it's just going to slide down the hill. And we're like, no, no, that will never work. We've never done that before. They, like, this is not, you know, this is not how it's done. I've been on these trips, like, tons of times. Trust me, I know what we're doing, you know. So we continue kind of in our methodology or whatever. And then we look over the way, and the two Ecuadorians who are guiding our team are knocking the bark off the tree, peeling it on the side of the hill, and sending it down. And you're like, you know what, let's try that. Let, let's... 
And what's funny is they actually overheard the student who had the idea and said, you know what, that might work. And tried it. And these things became like timber missiles, basically. Like once, once you got that thing going downhill, there was no stopping it. I think Sammy, you were, that was your idea. Sammy's right back there. She's the brilliant one who solved how to get timbers down. And this, this whole thing, sometimes when I was thinking about that moment, I'm thinking about what the author wants us to understand. Like Sammy discovered a better way to do something that we had been doing for years. Something that the Ecuadorian people had been doing for a long time before that. And here the author is developing this whole point to make a fundamental understanding in their minds to say there is a better way. There's a better way for us to do this. There's a better way for how you think about how we can relate to God, what he's accomplished on our behalf. And he wants to unfold this for them. So he's been, he's been talking about how Jesus is the great high priest, but now he wants to demonstrate how they can understand Jesus as a greater type of high priest, how they can understand him as a better way. So what do we know about Melchizedek? And what do we need to know about him to understand the point the author's making about Jesus? This passage here that we just read is referring back to this rather obscure interaction between this man Melchizedek and Abraham, the father of, of the people of Israel. It takes place in Genesis chapter 14. I'm not going to go there this morning just for the sake of time. You, can, you should definitely look at this on your own. But, but basically, he's giving a summary of what happens there. Abraham is returning home. He's just been in battle with these, these four foreign kings who have captured his nephew Lot and their entire family. He's rescued them from captivity. Abraham has, is now sort of reaping the rewards of his military success. He's experiencing uh, uh, a greater height of power and influence at, uh, at any time previous to this moment. And now, in, as he's carrying sort of the spoils of war off, seemingly out of nowhere, this previously unmentioned, mysterious figure, Melchizedek, arrives on the scene. And Melchizedek, and this is what's really odd about what transpires here, Melchizedek comes and blesses Abraham. And Abraham responds to this blessing by giving Melchizedek 10% of everything that he has. He has all this recently acquired income as a result of these military battles, and he gives 10% of it away as a offering of worship to Melchizedek. And so to wrap our heads around this, we have, to, we have to sort of transport ourselves back thousands of years to an ancient Near East mindset to understand the significance of this encounter. In this culture, there's a clear hierarchy, way things are done. There's an order. And now, in the midst of everything, this, this great father of, of the nation of Israel, the person that God had selected to establish his people, with whom he will make his covenant, it's not Abraham who is blessing Melchizedek. It is rather Melchizedek who is blessing Abraham. You see, this is so odd because in that culture, it was the greater of the two who had blessed the lesser. So this, this non-Israelite king shows up in this moment and he shows up as somebody who is superior to even Abraham. The, the, the patriarch, the, the, the beginning of it all, where God would establish his people. Melchizedek shows up this moment and it's Melchizedek who blesses Abraham, not the other way around. And it's Abraham who gives this worship offering to Melchizedek. Melchizedek is presented as the greater of the two figures. What's, what's interesting as well to note here is that Melchizedek is described as holding the office and title of king, but he also holds the office and title of priest of the Most High God. This is the only place anywhere in Israel's long history where the titles of king and priest have been applied to the same person. As a matter of fact, as, as God would establish his people, he would intentionally separate those roles so that there would be no compromise. But Melchizedek is both. It's the only time until we get to Jesus that somebody holds the title of both priest 
and king. After that moment in Genesis 14, we don't hear about Melchizedek for a thousand years. King David in Psalm 110 writes about his, his ancestors and he talks about how his ancestor, who will be both a king, because David is a king, and a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Looking forward, pointing us once again to Jesus. Again, silence. We don't hear about Melchizedek for another thousand years after David brings him up. And here, we get to this point. The author of Hebrews, now and nine times over the course of three chapters, keeps coming back to the person of Melchizedek. So what is his point? What does he want us to understand? I think he gives us some clues here. Look at the way he describes him. He says, look at his name. His name means king of righteousness. His title, king of Salem, means king of peace. His role is as the priest of the most high God in his lineage. Where he came from, he says he doesn't have one. At least it's not noted. His role of priest and of the Most High God isn't something that he received from his father or that he inherited from, from those before him. It's something that God directly gave him himself. It says that he's the king of righteousness, a king of peace, without beginning or without end, and he's sent from the Most High God. This is starting to sound familiar. Here, Melchizedek, and, and scholars debate this. But on the one hand, people look at this person, Melchizedek, and they, they would suggest that this is an appearance of Christ prior to the incarnation, prior to what we celebrate at, at Advent where Christ Jesus came as a baby. Other people just look at it as, as Melchizedek was a man that God divinely uh, appointed and ordained to be a priest. But what is clear, either way that we look at it, is that this is a person who is who is seeking his role, his office. He's been given this directly from God himself, and it's intended to point us to something, or in this case, someone greater, a better way. See, what he wants us to understand is that in the Old Testament, in, in the whole idea of the law, their whole understanding of the priesthood as they knew it was never meant to be permanent. It was never meant to be the final solution to, to their problem. Something better, something greater was on its way, was coming. And now, as the, the point that the authors make has now come, is here in the person of Jesus. In verse 11 of chapter 7, it says, Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, the priesthood that they knew and understand, for under it the people received the law. What further need would, we ha would there have been for another priest to arrive after the order of Melchizedek? So he's essentially saying if this, if this had accomplished it, if this had been successful, if this had, this had taken care of all of our problems, then what need would we have? But he's saying, but we know from experience that it didn't. He's making the case for why Jesus is not only our great high priest, but now he adds a whole other layer to the argument. He's saying he is a greater type of high priest, and as a greater type of high priest, he is able to do what the other high priests were unable to do. Verse 18 and 19, For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and its uselessness. For the law has made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Do you see what he's saying? Say, look at the shortcomings over here. But look at what's been accomplished by our greater high priest, our greater type of high priest. All of this then, because of who Jesus is and what he accomplished, this, this ushers in a better covenant. A better covenant. When I was a kid, especially if I stayed home sick from school, I used to love to watch... Um, um, Oh man, now that game show is escaping. Bob Barker with the tiny little mic. Price is Right, right? In the showcase showdown at the end. I would stay home and I'd watch that. And I don't know what, I don't know what it was about that, but I loved it. And they would always, back in those days, I'm sure now it's probably digital and, and, and that sort of thing, but they, when they would get to the showcase showdown, there would always be these really elaborate prizes, like really beautiful things, like a trip to Tahiti or something really nice. And they would reveal, like they'd open up the doors and there'd be this like scene 
with palm branches and white sand and blue water. It was this like really great display that they had created this, this trip to Tahiti that the person was, was hoping to win. And I've thought about that for a minute because what if in the moment that you win that prize and you're like, yes, and they wheel it out and, and what they give you was the display. Like, this is what you've won. Look how beautiful this is. You're going to put this in your living room and you're going to have all these wonderful memories or, or uh, dreams about Tahiti and all this incredible thing. Like, think of the shortcoming that that would be in comparison to the real thing. Because this is what the author is trying to paint the picture of here. He's trying to say, like, you've won the prize. Like, it's been delivered. It's been accomplished. But you're settling for a picture of something so much greater. You're settling for this display that somebody made of this beautiful thing when the real thing, the trip to Tahiti or whatever it is, the real thing is available to you. He's saying don't settle for a picture of something greater. Don't settle. When you're being offered the genuine article, you don't want to miss out on this. Turn back to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews 7. Now all the way down in verse 20 through 24. I want want us to get this. He says, for on the one hand, the former commandment is set aside, whoops, wrong verse, 20, and it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath, but this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said of him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. We're going to talk more about this over the course of the next couple weeks, but I just want to highlight a couple of essential points that I think this writer is emphasizing here. Because, because the covenants, the promise of God, the, the promises that God made between him and Abraham, the, the, the covenants between God and Moses and, and God and the people of Israel in the Old Testament, those are the very fabric of their faith. This is, this is their source of confidence. We know that God said he'll do. We know what God said he'll do because he has made a covenant with us, a covenant that could not be broken. And now he says, there's a greater promise. A greater, a, a greater covenant has been established and it's been guaranteed. Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant. I almost think that that announcement, those words in and of themselves would have been hard for them to wrap their head around because they could not, they could not imagine a better covenant. They, they couldn't a, a picture a way that God would make a, a greater promise to them. And yet he says that that he has. He's saying that the author now is tying the superiority of Jesus' priesthood into ushering in the provision of a better covenant. And the whole covenant, it says, is grounded in and it's founded by the eternal oath, the eternal promise of God. Look at, look at how he makes this point further down in verse 26 now. It says, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a great high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests. But the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who's been made perfect forever. You see what he's doing here? He's saying, compare what you knew, the, 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 the priesthood that you knew. He's saying they were, they were many, but Jesus is the one and only. They were temporary, but Jesus is eternal. They, they were flawed. They had to make atonement for their own sin, but, but Jesus was perfect, holy, innocent, and unstained. They would sacrifice daily for the sins of the people. Jesus made a sacrifice once and for all. They would offer the blood of animals and Jesus would offer up his own blood. You see, this is the difference. This is what distinguishes. This is why Jesus is the great high priest 
in the order of Melchizedek. This is why he is the guarantor of a better covenant. This is where our, our assurance comes from as Christians. This is why we can be confident that the promises that we see in Scripture will be realized in our lives because of who Jesus is and what he did. The Christians that were receiving this letter some 2,000 years ago were beginning to doubt the validity of, of their promises in the face of persecution. But the author wants to establish this one clear fundamental point that they have a superior high priest who has established a superior covenant and he himself is the guarantee. This is where we get our confidence from. This is, is, is why when we talk about prior to Jesus, those priests that would sacrifice to, to cover their own sins, he's saying don't settle for a picture of something when the real thing is available to you. Like get the genuine article. And then ultimately it leads to a greater salvation. A greater salvation. And, and, and this really I think is the thrust of the whole line of argument that, the, that he wants to make. Because the question that remains is, is, what does this do? What is the result of all of this? And I think this is where it gets, gets really good. This is chapter 7, verse 25. It says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He is able to save to the uttermost you see, this is the result. This is the accomplishment of this. This is the crowning achievement of the great high priest that he is able to save to the uttermost. That Greek word there for the uttermost means both, it contains the idea of both time and extent. So he's saying Jesus is able to save in every way, all of it, for all times. I mean, it's a pretty incredible thing. Like if, you, if you've ever been, had a family member, as I had, who has, who has gone through cancer surgery. Like the question that you ask following that event is did they get it all? And what the author of Hebrews is saying is he got it all. Like he got all of it. He's able to save to the uttermost. I, I think of it this way. Like when my wife and I brought, bought a, a brand new van. You know like when you have a new car you're meticulous about everything. And we made the unfortunate mistake of letting our kids get in there. And that first time, the apple juice gets spilled, right? There's no going back. Like, you can clean that thing for hours, and it is never going to be new again. This is the point that he's making here, is Jesus makes us new again. He takes us back to our original design. He says in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, I love the way uh, Paul He's another author of, of these letters in, in the New Testament. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That is being able to be saved to the uttermost. This is my firm conviction. And I want you to hear me on this. Because, and, and this is a bit of, of me sort of maybe exposing my own bias. But the power of these words and the significance of what's being said here, my, my, my sense is that if, if we can communicate this effectively, if I can describe this appropriately, if I can give this its due, like why would anyone not want this? Why would anyone reject this, this offer? Because if we understand it correctly, what, what we have with a greater high priest, what he accomplished for us, then we would never walk away from it. See, I think what, what he's saying here is don't, don't lose sight of who Jesus is. Don't lose sight of what he's done for you because there's nothing that can accomplish for you what he's done. This is why Christianity isn't a religion. This is why following Jesus isn't a religion. It's a relationship. This is what makes it entirely unique is that he's done it for us. He is able to save us to the uttermost. He is not only our great high priest who is without limitations, he is our great high priest who would make himself the very sacrifice that was required to save us to the uttermost. So the question that, that all of us have to answer, 
at one point in time in our love is what's going to make us good enough? What, what is going to make us presentable before a perfect and holy God? The author here is saying it's one thing. There's only one option. It's our great high priest, a superior high priest who ushered in a superior covenant because he offers a greater, uh, a superior salvation. He's able to save to the uttermost. Would you pray with me? Father, I just thank you for this day and I thank you for this opportunity to look at this ancient, oftentimes confusing letter. And yet when you see this story begin to unfold and you see how he is presenting this case before the people and what he wants his heart for them, Lord, we recognize that that's also a reflection of your heart for us. God, I just I praise you and I thank you that we have a Savior who is able to save us to the uttermost, who gets it all. Lord, meet us in, in this place. May we be found in you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Before I uh, offer this morning's benediction, I, I, you know, sometimes when you're up there talking, I get in a, a groove, and I, I sometimes I forget, or I, I, I make assumptions about where everyone's at, and, and I, I want you to know that as we're talking, you're going to hear us talk a lot about a relationship with Christ. That's pretty much at the core of, of who we are and what we're about. But we also recognize that all of us are coming at this from different places and in different ways. And if there's ever a time that you're asking yourself, well, what does that look like and how do I experience that? That's what we're here for, to share that good news. You'll hear me talk about it from up here from time to time as well. But that's what also these people around the room are, are here for as well. Or, or come talk to me. That's, that is at the heart of, of what we love to share. And so um, I, I wanted to make that clear this morning. Now receive this morning's benediction. Go now in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the guarantor of a greater covenant, who is a superior high priest, and who has provided a way for a greater salvation. Amen.